In today's lesson, I would like to show you how to create a custom implementation of STD vector that is fully compatible with the standard STD vector. In our implementation, we will utilize STD allocator to allocate memory for the internal array where we will store the data. Here we have another block of declarations where we define types. These types are similar to the ones we used in our previous lesson when implementing STD array. Additionally, we introduce STD allocator here, which we'll use to declare these types. How will we store the data for the elements of the array? We will utilize a memory pointer to store the elements of the array, which will be divided into two sections. The first section will hold the actual array elements, while the second section will reserve uninitialized memory for future element insertion. To allocate the memory block for the array, we will employ STD allocator. STD vector represents a dynamic array that can change its size. Therefore, we need to address the resizing aspect. We have two primary methods here, grow and shrink, which are responsible for adjusting the size of the array. The grow method ensures that we have sufficient memory allocated to accommodate at least the specified number of elements in the array. An array has both a size and a capacity. The capacity refers to the maximum number of elements that can fit within the allocated memory block for the array. The purpose of the grow method is to increase the capacity so that it matches or exceeds the desired value. How can we ensure that the capacity is at least new size? If the capacity is already sufficient, we can simply return without taking any further action. However, if there is a possibility of exceeding the maximum size of the array, we will throw an exception. Next, we need to determine the new capacity of the array. We will apply a commonly used strategy where we double the capacity of the array. For instance, if the current capacity is 4, the new capacity will be 8. This code calculates the new capacity that we want to allocate. We allocate a new memory block for the array elements using the allocate method. It is important to note that this method may throw an exception in case there is insufficient memory available. Upon executing this code, we obtain a valid pointer to the newly allocated memory block. Next, we proceed to transfer the elements of the array from the old memory block to the newly allocated one. This task is accomplished by the following for loop. In each iteration, it constructs an element in the new array and moves the data from the corresponding element in the old array. Furthermore, it calls the destructor for each element in the old array. Upon completion of this for loop, the old memory block will solely contain uninitialized memory 
while the new memory block will hold the elements from the old memory block. We assign the new memory block to the internal pointer of the array and update its capacity to the new value. It is essential to note that the allocate function solely reserves a memory block without initializing any objects within it. To create an object in that memory, we can utilize the construct method, which invokes the constructor at the specified memory location. Similarly, the destroy method functions by calling the destructor of the object. Additionally, the deallocate operation releases the memory previously allocated, assuming it is already empty and no longer in use. To reduce the capacity of the array and free up unused memory, we can invoke the shrink method. If the capacity is already equal to the number of elements in the array, we can return immediately. Otherwise, we proceed to calculate the new capacity using a similar approach as before. We will continuously have the capacity in an inverse manner until we have enough space to accommodate all the elements in the array. If the capacity is zero, we release the memory and set the internal pointer to nulpture, indicating that the array is empty. If that is not the case, we allocate a smaller memory block and transfer the elements into it. Then, we remove the old memory block and update the data accordingly. All right, let's explore how to use the grow and shrink methods. We strive to achieve functionality similar to that of STD vector, or at least come close to it. To accomplish this, we will gradually explore how it works, understanding its functionality in detail. The access to elements is essentially identical to that of STD array. The methods and their meanings are the same, providing seamless access to elements within the array. The app methods, when given an invalid index, will raise an exception. On the other hand, the square bracket operator will directly return a reference to the element without validating the index. The iterators are implemented in a similar manner to our implementation of a fixed size array. This method determines whether the array is empty by checking if its size is zero, meaning it has no elements. The size method returns the number of elements in the array. The max underscore size method provides the maximum theoretical number of elements that the array can accommodate. The reserve method allocates capacity for the specified number of elements in the array. When we anticipate inserting a large number of elements, it is advantageous to use this method and provide an estimated value if we know the expected number of elements in advance. This method increases the reserved capacity without triggering unnecessary memory reallocation. This method returns the capacity of the array. It provides the maximum number of elements that the array can currently hold without triggering any reallocation of memory. The shrink to fit method reduces the capacity of the array to match the actual number of elements, minimizing memory usage if possible. The clear method removes all elements from the array without changing its capacity. The resize method increases or decreases the size of the array to a predefined size. 
Let's explore how it is done. If the new size is the same, we naturally do not perform any action. However, if the new size is different, and we have more elements in the array than desired, we will remove the excess elements. If the new size of the array is greater than the current number of elements, we can simply insert the additional elements using the insert method. The resize method has either one or two parameters. The first parameter represents the new number of elements in the array, while the second parameter, if provided, is the value used for initialization. Let's move on to the next methods. The important ones are insert and erase, which allow us to insert and delete elements in the array, respectively. Let's start by discussing the insert method. The insert methods have several variations. You can insert a single value, a predetermined number of elements, or a range defined by iterators. Alternatively, you can use an initializer list to insert multiple elements at once. Now let's explore how it works in practice. So, the simplest form of the insert method is invoked by providing the value to be inserted and the iterator, POS, indicating the position where the new element should be inserted. It calls the push underscore back method, which inserts the element at the end. This code may appear complex, but it's not as complicated as it seems. It essentially rearranges all the elements to ensure that the new element is positioned at the specified iterator. The iterator POS represents the position where we want to insert the element. It can also be the end iterator, indicating that we want to insert the element at the end. This code ensures the rotation of the elements in such a way that the new element is placed at the specified position. It achieves this by shifting the elements accordingly. This is another variation of the previous method, but it accepts an value reference as a parameter. This allows for the possibility of moving the contents of objects to a new location in the array. The insert method inserts a predetermined number of elements with the same specified value at the position given by the iterator POS. If the number of elements to be inserted is zero, no elements are inserted, and we return immediately. We store the distance from the beginning of the array. In this case, we need to enlarge the capacity of the array to ensure it can accommodate the specified number of elements to be inserted. Next, within a loop, we insert the specified number of elements. Initially, these new elements are placed at the end of the array. However, we then utilize the rotate method to reposition them to the desired location indicated by the iterator POS. Why do we measure the distance instead of using the iterator POS directly? The rationale behind this approach is to avoid potential issues with iterator invalidation when the grow method is invoked. By calculating and storing the distance, 
we ensure a reliable reference point for repositioning the elements even after the array's capacity is expanded. Finally, we return the iterator pointing to the beginning of the newly inserted sequence. Another variant of the insert method functions similarly, but it accepts a range of iterators for insertion. So, let's discuss what this templated construct means. It is present here to prevent the unnecessary usage of this method if the provided iterators are not of the same value type as the array. It ensures that the method is only used with compatible iterators of the same value type. Similarly, we first determine if there is anything to insert at all. If not, we return the iterator that was passed to us. Otherwise, we measure the distance from the beginning to the position, just like in the previous case. By increasing the capacity of the array, we make room for the new elements, and then we insert the elements at the end. Subsequently, the elements are moved using the rotate method to their desired positions, and then we return the iterator to the first element of the inserted portion. This variant accepts an initializer list as input. It simply calls the variant of the method that takes iterators, so we pass these iterators accordingly. Now let's discuss the erase method. The erase method also has several variants. Now let's explore the erase method. This method allows us to remove elements from the array, and it comes in different variations. When using this method, we can specify either an iterator to delete a single element, or a range of iterators to delete a specific range of elements. Everything is implemented using the erase simple method, so let's dive into its details. First, we verify if there is anything to erase. If not, we immediately return the iterator that was passed to us. However, this may seem a bit intricate at first glance. Essentially, what we are doing is relocating the specified range of elements to the end of the array. This repositioning enables us to easily remove them. So, STD Rotate simply accomplishes the task of moving the specified range to the end. The original range of elements that was previously positioned at the end is shifted to the middle. Subsequently, all allocated objects are destroyed. We then adjust the size of the array by subtracting the specified number of elements from the current size. Finally, we return an iterator. The destroy method invokes destructors of the allocated objects that are being destroyed within the specified range we want to erase. The clear method removes all elements from the vector. However, to achieve behavior similar to STD vector, it does not affect the capacity. This means that only the elements are cleared, which is done using the erase method. The pushback method has two variants, both of which store an element at the end of the array. There are two variations available, one accepting a constant reference and the other accepting a value reference. How does it accomplish this? Here's how it is done. 
First, we invoke the grow method since we want to insert an additional element. The parameter for grow is calculated as size plus 1. Next, we construct the new element at the designated position using the appropriate constructor and increment the count of elements in the array. This method is essentially the same, except that we use std move here. The swap method performs the operation of swapping the contents of two vectors. How does it do that? It simply exchanges the internal data with the data of the other vector. It may also swap the allocators, if applicable. Let's move on to the pop underscore back method. Here, we can utilize the erase method that we already have. The erase method accomplishes the task by taking an iterator to the element preceding the end, and it provides a straightforward implementation. Indeed, let's move on to the constructors. Constructors work by invoking the familiar methods we've discussed. The simplest one is the default constructor, which creates an empty vector. This constructor creates an array of a predetermined size with elements initialized to a given default value. This vector creates an array containing elements from a range of iterators. This is essentially a copy constructor where we simply insert all elements from the other vector using the insert method. This move constructor simply exchanges the data in the constructor code. This constructor utilizes an initializer list. This is the destructor, responsible for deleting all elements. It first removes all elements using the clear method, and then calls the shrink method to release the allocated memory. Let's move on to the assignment operators. Right, these are the assignment operators. We have two versions, one with a constant reference and one with an value reference. Let's take a look at them. So with the constant reference, we first clear all the data and then insert elements from the given array into it. The variant with value reference simply swaps the internal data. Thank you for your attention, and we'll see you in the next lesson.